This is Greg Troutwine with Maritime Reporter TV, and we're here today with Christoph Kozdron, the Managing Director of Schulte Marine Concepts, to discuss SMC's recent milestone and promising backlog of projects for the coming year. So Christoph, to start, can you just give an overview, a by-the-numbers look at uh, Schulte Marine Concepts today using the metrics of your choice? Uh, good day, Greg. Yeah, indeed, it's quite an interesting milestone. Uh, well, being an engineer, it's quite easy for me to talk numbers. So the numbers are as follows. Uh, we have managed recently to cross the line of 600 vessels. Uh, that includes vessels that we had delivered and the one we are currently uh, building. And uh, in addition to that, we've got uh, more than 80 shipyards in over 20 countries with the track record of 119 clients. That's all over the world. Interesting fact, the smallest vessel we have handled, uh, the market value of the vessel was $500,000. It was quite interesting uh, ferry boat. And the most expensive single unit was $800 million. That was uh, part of the FPSO project. And that's, that has been achieved uh, with uh, over 170 staff that has been working for SMC for the last uh, few years. So, Again, you mentioned it in your opening uh, metrics, uh, your 600th project completed, which is impressive, of course. Can you discuss the significance of that milestone as well as discuss the current backlog that you have? Well, the 600, the number, we started counting vessels in 1973. But this interesting probably is the fact that we started in 1973 looking after our own vessels. Uh, that was in the uh, good old days. Uh, well, since we have expanded into third party clients. And as we speak now, uh, majority of our projects are the projects we run for third party clients. Uh, with our own projects today, it's actually uh, two smaller projects that we've got uh, on our grid. Uh, we have a global presence. Uh, we are building ships uh, starting from the east to west. And uh, actually, the 600 vessels uh, figure number that includes virtually each and every type of the vessel. That is also quite interesting that we are not dedicated to the particular type of vessel, but uh, we've got this expertise and we managed to penetrate each and every type of the, of the vessel that is on the water. As far as the order book is concerned, despite uh, COVID-19, uh, we are still uh, surviving. As we now speak, we've got exactly 91 vessels under construction. And these vessels are being constructed in Korea, in China, and also in Europe. And it's actually quite interesting that after many years, we managed to get back to Europe. And we've been kind of enjoying a bit of uh, shipbuilding experience uh, again in Europe. Good to be back home. And unfortunately, today, we still can't have a business discussion without looking at it through the lens of COVID-19. Um, from where you sit, can you give an overview, your assessment of the new ship construction, construction business in Asia today? Well, COVID indeed, uh, COVID has impacted a little bit of our life uh, work last year, 2020. There was uh, kind of that noticeable slowdown for the period of two, three months. Uh, after that, the shipbuilding industry, both in China and Korea, started slowly picking up. And uh, basically, by end of May, we were back in business, 100% uh, of revolutions. Today, uh, shipyards are working uh, at full speed, well, at just capacity, but full speed. Uh, we don't have uh, any, um, any effect of COVID, except a bit of inconvenience probably for the clients uh, and uh, ship managers trying to come over to take the lead of the vessel. And for the clients, well, that's quite interesting experience, actually. Uh, starting from last year, we were forced to shift our traditional, conventional shipbuilding contract negotiation from face-to-face -face struggle that was usually lasting two, three weeks, and that involved a lot of traveling. Now we sit quite comfortably in our offices, and some of our clients are actually sitting home, and we do the uh, con uh, contract negotiations uh, for the video conferencing. And uh, the first... Uh, Two contracts were quite challenging, but believe me, today it is a quite comfortable and very efficient time. Mind that you are saving so many days on doing this uh, 
transcontinental flights, then you are avoiding jet lag, et cetera, et cetera. It does work. So uh, as of today, as today uh, <clears throat> COVID has got no adverse effect on the shipbuilding uh, capability capacity here in Asia. When you look at the ship repair and conversion situation in the region, is it roughly the same as new build or can you give your assessment of that? Well, it's ship, ship repair and conversions last year were affected the same manner as the new building projects. But I have to say that uh, shipyards uh, very quickly learn uh, how to implement very efficient screening and testing uh, process uh, for the vessel arriving with the crew on board. And uh, today the system works very well. Uh, there is, uh, the process is known in advance. Crew can uh, prepare, we, crew can be prepared for the process. So vessel arrives, there's a bit of the quarantine, but again, it does not affect uh, effectiveness of the uh, ship repair conversion. Also, as worth mentioning that uh, we've got here in Asia, all the required service engineers, there's no need uh, for service engineers to travel from Europe or from, uh, from, from America, as they are available here locally and they are available for installation, commissioning, uh, troubleshooting. So there is really not much of adverse effect. But when you look at the new construction uh, market today, what do you consider to be the main drivers? Well, it's a very good question indeed. Uh, well, uh, there are usual suspects. Uh, they are economical interests and investment opportunities. But these investment opportunities are, today, they are not playing a major role. Uh, what is interesting uh, to mention, uh, new trading roads. Uh, everybody now is talking about Northern Corridor. So that is creating new opportunities for the ship owners, but also for the shipyards. We need new types of the vessels, new concept of the vessel. So that is uh, quite uh, an interesting demand. New cargos and new business. Uh, as an example, new cargo, eat and business, eat and trade. It is uh, generated a uh, new type of the vessel and based on the LNG carrier. It's kind of the, uh, something between LPG and LNG carrier. So that was quite interesting stimulus to the market. Another interesting ex uh, example is uh, LNG bunkering sector. That is completely new type of the vessel uh, being driven by environmental uh, consciousness and awareness. And the market is uh, developing quite interestingly. Uh, then we've got, of course, a natural process of fleet renewal. Vessels, unfortunately, uh, get old, they're aging, and uh, they need to be replaced. However, this natural process of fleet renewal is uh, slowed down by certain uncertainties. Mm -hmm. The general global business, I mean, today, as you mentioned, container vessels, bull carriers, uh, they have days of glory. Uh, but last year was a really bad year. So there was a bit of uh, reluctance from the ship owners, uh, traditional ship owners to invest without knowing what's going to be the, the future. The second, uh, I wouldn't say break, but the significant slowdown is uh, triggered by fuels, alternative fuels, which are a consequence of emissions. I think we can discuss it uh, a bit later. It's quite an interesting topic because that is, uh, this, this topic is shaping the future of both shipping, shipbuilding, and also conversions. When you look at the drivers for the ship repair and conversion market, what are they today? I think we need to split this into two categories because they are the completely different cattle of fish. Uh, ship repairs, uh, uh, let's be more specific, uh, dry docking of the vessels or sending, shipyard, uh, sh sending vessels to the shipyard. Uh, unlike in case of the new buildings, uh, there is kind of the, uh, a regime uh, established by regulatory uh, compliance and vessels, they have to go to shipyard, whether they like it or not, they have to go to shipyard at a certain period of time and the more mature they get, they need to go a bit more frequently. That is unavoidable, but it is absolutely so. Uh, basically, ship, uh, ship repair business, they have a pretty good idea how many vessels annually needs to go into the shipyard. The different story is what's going to be the extent of the works that are being carried out in the shipyard. And of course, when the owners are bleeding, uh, which was the case of last year, and when every panic, every panic comes, a lot of uh, maintenance work is uh, done by the crew or the writing squads. 
So basically you go to the shipyard and you try to minimize the scope of the work only to the works that cannot be carried out by, by the group. So that was the case the, the case uh, last year. Uh, conventions, uh, that's a different story, an interesting one. Uh, this market is usually driven by a couple of interesting factors. Opportunities, these are purely commercially driven, but the second one is quite interesting, at least from the technical perspective, it's a necessity. And the typical scenario here is, uh, imagine the place uh, that requires electrical power, but there's no power plant in the vicinity, but you need to provide the power. What do you do? Well, you think about, well, let's make a conversion that generate the floating power plant. Uh, the second uh, typical one that is also breathing with this environmental uh, area is uh, a lot of power plants are being converted from uh, fuel oil to natural gas. And that's relatively simple work. What is more difficult is to find the gas that you can fit the power plant with. So what is happening is that uh, a lot of FSRU conversion projects are popping up and they are creating a kind of the gap temporary gap, a patch on the gap until the, the pipeline is uh, with the gas is provided. So that, that will be the track interesting uh, drive. Uh, question, why conversion, why not new building? That is a million dollars question uh, virtually. Well, if you look at, uh, at CapEx as such, uh, of course the conversion will be uh, cheaper than a new build. But if you take into account that usually you take the conversion of the second hand vessel, when you do all mathematics, uh, it's not the capex, it is the shorter delivery date. The new building project is lasting uh, 25, 26, 30 months when conversion, if properly prepared, executed, you can do it within uh, six to 10, 12 months. So you've got this advantage of uh, shorter delivery date. When you look at ship owners doing business in Asia, whether it is new build, conversion, or repair, what are the challenges today? Well, the usual suspects. It's, today, uh, the first one that is uh, emotional or historical is that uh, when they want to sign, when they want to develop and execute new building project, they cannot make it personally because of travel restrictions. It takes a bit of courage uh, to overcome this. Uh, it's mostly emotional inconvenience, but it can be done. Uh, the second challenge for the owners to develop a uh, new building project today, it's unfortunately uh, driven by the demand of trying to attempting to make vessels more environment friendly in terms of the emissions. And then brings us to two major topics, the alternative fuels, and available technology. On the fuels, uh, unfortunately, we don't have too many alternatives. Uh, we talk about LNG, we talk about LPG, ammonia, and methanol. The difficulty with this uh, potential fuels is the availability. You can get them easily in the major hubs, uh, shipping hubs, but vessels are not always privileged with sailing from Singapore to Shanghai or to Hong Kong. Uh, they usually go also to the remote places. So availability of these fuels is problematic. Then you've got a uh, second challenge is the technology. Uh, once you decide to go for the alternative fuel, you need to have equipment, machinery systems capable of being operated on these fuels. And this is where the technology is a little bit lagging behind. We've got today proven technology for LNG, we are almost there with LPG. However, metal ammonia is still in the early childhood of the technology. So these are the main, uh, main challenges. And uh, there's always a certain level of risk involved in stepping into technology that is not yet uh, mature and proven, especially in marine applications. Uh, there's nothing new with using uh, methanol, uh, methanol uh, to operate uh, engines uh, on, but on shore. If you try to translate it uh, or transfer it from the shore to the marine environment, that is a completely different situation. It's a, it's a game changer. So these are the, the main uh, challenges. Another one is also driven by the uh, environmental expectations. It's overall 
energy, energy efficiency of the vessel. Vessels are supposed to basically put it in the simple language, vessels are supposed to burn less fuel and carry more cargo. Uh, so there's a bit of challenge for the designers to make vessel a bit more efficient from the hydrodynamic perspective. Uh, there's a bit of challenge for the equipment makers. There's also a bit of the challenge for the vessel to make it uh, operational friendly. So there's a list of challenges is quite long. Uh, but uh, well, that's uh, why we are here, engineers. When you look at your business in the coming 12 to 24 months, what do you see? Well, I'm always optimistic. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, figures and numbers, uh, last, last years were extremely bad for the shipbuilding industry. The number of new building orders uh, was uh, extremely low. We were, I got the data in the front of me, uh, we were lowest since 1996. So I don't think uh, shipping uh, can continue like that. The vessels have to be replaced. We need more vessels, we need newer vessels. So it can be only better. Uh, maybe not today, but definitely tomorrow, definitely next year. Uh, especially if you take into account this uh, replace mechanism, fleet replace mechanism that is imposed by uh, environmental expectations. So I'm absolutely positive. Uh, mm, we have no choice. We have to be positive. We have to drive the industry to the different levels of efficiency, environmental awareness, and compliance. Mm -hmm.